IO graphing can be done on live traffic as you're capturing it or on existing trace files. So I'll start capturing some traffic here. I'm going to capture traffic off the local network and I'm not using any sort of a capture filter. Now I'll select statistics and IO graph. And now it's graphing out the traffic that I'm able to see in the background. By default, it will graph all of the traffic based on either the bytes or the packet count. By default, it's set to look at packets per tick, every tick being one second. We can change that and say we want to see bytes per tick. There we go. Now we see the y-axis has changed. Now we're able to see bytes per tick. So here we see 500,000 bytes per tick, 1 million bytes per tick. If I wanted to, I could add a second line here to graph some, some other type of traffic, and I would use display filter syntax to do that. Section 8 in this court, course covers display filters thoroughly. So at this point, I've typed in ARP. I'll click graph number 2, and now it will go through, and I should have a graph that compares all the traffic to the ARP traffic. And you can see, compared to all the traffic, ARP traffic is minimal. Now I have a file transfer going on in the background and I just stopped my file transfer. And in a moment you should see, there we go, now we see the traffic sort of dropping off there. If I wanted to, I could get rid of graph number one and just see ARP traffic. And that gives, gives me the ARP bytes per second that are happening on the wire right now. This network has a lot of ARP traffic on it. I'll bring it back graph number one. There we go. Now, in addition, you can change the format of the graphing. So right now, it's graphing as a line. I'm going to change that to an impulse, or you have the option of changing it to an F bar, which is solid. I'll take it back to line, which is the default. Now, at this time, I'm going to close down this I.O. graph, and I'm going to stop capturing in the background. I'm going to get rid of that trace information. I don't care about that. And I'm going to o open a trace file. And this trace file is called io-ftp upload. And this trace file shows somebody trying to do an FTP upload to a server, but the performance is really, really bad. This time, what we're going to do is we'll look at the general IO graph. And from there, we'll move on to the advanced IO graph. Now, when I was in the general I.O. graph, you saw me change from packets per tick over to bytes per tick, which I prefer. And this is a long uh, trace file. It's 800 and about 815 seconds long. So as I go back in time, look at that. We've got some points in the uh, transfer where we've got some really bad I.O. problems here. Look at that. All of a sudden, we drop down to almost no traffic being exchanged. And this is an, this is an FTP upload. This should all be automatic, and we should always see that there's you know, a nice rate of traffic crossing the cabling system. It's kind of interesting that it looks like we have a ceiling right here. It could be because our pipe is being throttled, or we've got some sort of a bandwidth, uh, bandwidth um, maximum set for ourselves. But we shouldn't see this drop down like that in an automated process like an FTP upload. That just really looks bad. So we know that there's some sort of a problem around uh, 600 seconds into the trace file. We can also see, let's see, where's another problem? Uh, around 320 seconds into the trace file. We almost drop off to no traffic. And then at 150 seconds into the trace file, 40 seconds into the trace file. So there are a lot of times in here where we're having real problems. Now, with a long trace like that, I might want to see more than just between, you know, 415 seconds and 510 seconds. In that case, we can change the pixels per tick, and we can uh, say that we want to go only two pixels per tick. Now, that lets us see a little bit more there. We can also change the tick interval. So we can say we want to plot this for a 10-second interval. And there we can see that it kind of scrunches it together. So if it scrunches it together too much, go to the pixels per tick and, and widen that out so it's nice and clean. Now we can see the whole entire trace file. And sure enough, we can see around 600 seconds into the trace there's a problem, 300 seconds into the trace, about 150 seconds into a trace, about 40 seconds into the trace we have those problems where the I.O. drops off. Now as far as the y-axis goes, it's going to figure out what the best setting should be based on the values that it's trying to plot. But if you want to, you can override that. For example, right now, as it's summarizing those, it's up to uh, 500,000 for the bytes per tick value. Maybe I want to change that. I know this is going to scroll off of the screen, but I'll change it to maybe 1 million. 
So there you can see we can play with the y-axis and change the way that that graph looks. I'll go back to the auto setting for that scale. And now in the y-axis area in unit, I'm going to click the drop-down arrow and I'll select advanced. Now I know this isn't going to fit on the screen completely because of the resolution that I'm doing the recording at. So I'm going to have to move this over a little bit to the left-hand side. There we go. Now we still have the graph buttons, and that's the way we turn on or off, enable or disable different graphing lines. But now, and we, and we still have the filter capability there, so I can still say that I want to filter on ARP traffic or traffic to and from a different IP address or something like that. But now we have these calculations right here. And the calculation options are sum, count, max, min, average, and load. Load is one that you would typically use with relative time fields only. That's the only thing they can be used for. Whereas sum, count, max, min, and average are a little more useful. You can use them for different things. Sum will add up the values in a field. So, for example, maybe you want to plot the TCP lengths. We want to find out how much data is contained after the TCP header. So I'll type in tcp.len, that is the field name, that's what we're allowed to filter on, the value name. And I'll show you in a moment where you can get the whole value list of what can go into this particular field. Now I'll click on graph one, and there, it's gone ahead and it's graphed the TCP length information. So it's gone into every single one of the packets and looked at how much payload is in there, and then it's added it up over a 10 second time and plotted it on my graph here. I'm going to change the interval back to one second. Here we go. So here we can see that it's just adding up the TCP lengths and there we can see where we have some of those problems in the trace and I'll go back in time. Look, you know, that is just awful there. Look at that huge time there where it's trying to add up how many bytes are going across the cabling system. It just doesn't add up to anything. Now the count on the left hand side is something that we might use to count analysis events. For example, Wireshark can track things such as uh, the TCP retransmissions or the TCP um, window full conditions or how many times there's a lost segment or how many times there's a duplicate ACK. Let me show you an example of setting this up. I'm going to type in TCP analysis retransmission. And I'm going to do a count on that. Here we go. We can see that we have a number of points where the retransmission rate hits almost up to 10 retransmissions. And remember, I'm plotting per second. So that's a, an awful lot of retransmissions that occur. And here we can see there's a whole bunch of retransmissions that occur just before 500 seconds in the trace. Now here's another one that we can plot. Let's do TCP uh, analysis duplicate ACK. And I'm going to plot that in red. There we go. Now the interesting thing here is as you learn TCP IP communications, you'll realize that most of the time the duplicate 